Good evening and welcome to Company Roots. Today we are interviewing Professor Nathaniel Raymond, the former director of the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology and their operations for the initiative Satellite Sentinel Project at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Mr. Raymond has also served Oxum International and Oxum America on the ground in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and Ethiopia. He's currently a lecturer in Yale at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Mr. Raymond, it is a privilege and we are truly honored to interview you today. My name is Rob. Oh. <laughs> oh, the honor is mine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming on today. My name is Raul Kavoru. I'm a sophomore at St. Paul School in New Hampshire, and I am the president of Company Roots. My name is Therese Jasti, and I'm a senior at Home Hill High School, and I'm the founder of Company Roots. And the first question that we always ask is, what are your company roots, and how do they help you in shaping the person you are today and the ideas you have? Um, so uh, I don't have a company, but uh, <laughs> I, I would say um, uh, my roots uh, really come from a uh, uh, the events around 9/11. Um, so everything I, I do in my career today is because of uh, the experience I had um, in the aftermath of 9/11. I don't know if I'm answering the question uh, properly, but uh, yeah. I um, yeah. yeah I I was uh, uh, working for Physicians for Human Rights in support of the forensic program. Um, of the United Nations, and uh, a massacre happened in the uh, um, aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, um, and this massacre was committed by a U.S. ally. Um, it was known as the Dashi Laili Massacre, where uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda prisoners were suffocated in container trucks, allegedly, and uh, so I investigated that uh, massacre with uh, Newsweek magazine, mm -hmm. and uh, um, we were the lead forensic agency for the United Nations, and um, uh, all of our witnesses in that investigation were murdered. And it was uh, the the experience of losing um, uh, local uh, civilians on the ground. Um, that changed the course of everything I did afterwards. Right. So it was the experience of having um, uh, civilians be affected by an attempt to do good um, and to be the casualties of that that really has directed my career uh, mm -hmm. to be all about civilian protection. Right. So you spearheaded the anti-torture campaign for PHR, um, which you claimed may have been one of the greatest medical ethics scandals in American history. So, um, um, not the campaign, but the, the <laughs> but, but uh, the, the CIA torture program. Yeah. 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 So, do you think that there's still work to be done on that case? Cause it seems like, um, a lot of the people that were involved weren't actually prosecuted. Yeah. Ju um, justice never sleeps. The need for justice never sleeps, um, and justice takes a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, if we if we look at the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa, uh, that took decades. If we look at, um, I'm just putting up the window here because my neighbor is using a power tool. Um, we look at um, multiple um, reconciliation processes um, around the world, Argentina. Bosnia, um, it takes a long time. And the, the worst thing you can do, um, so I think this is important for your audience to hear, um, the two worst things you can do when you're facing an injustice is one, believe that um, the bad guys can win. Mm -hmm. um, the bad guys only win when you stop trying. Um, and, and two is that um, to believe that uh, justice is about the past. Um, justice is about the future right. and as much as the past. And so, um, and justice can happen in a variety of different ways. Now, you're absolutely right that the, those who are, had command responsibility for the routinized um, use of torture 
um, in both CIA and U.S. Department of Defense after 9-11 have not been held to account. No one has gone to jail for those clear violations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, federal law, and the Geneva Conventions. Right. Um, but the fact is, is that um, we now have a clearer uh, history through the work of the Senate Select Committee on, on uh, Intelligence and the work of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And that story is still incomplete, but we have to continue to seek accountability uh, for the torture program um, so it doesn't happen again. Right. And the way we prevent that is by continuing to tell the whole history. Um, so that work is not over, um, but all is not lost. Yeah. So how exactly should people right now try to fight for anti-torture codes? Um, very simply that uh, it, it's, we, we have the law. The law is clear, both domestically and internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about fighting for the codes. It's about fighting for states to follow them. And uh, for me, what the damage, the real damage that was done by the United States adopting what until then was known as the methods of regimes like the Nazis, um, like the communist uh, regime in Vietnam. Um, they were considered uh, the tools of the enemy. The real danger is that the United States adopting those tactics and not holding those who use them to account gave the green light to countless regimes around the world uh, to use them as well. And it's about normative frameworks. When we push governments to adhere to human rights standards, we're creating a expectation that that's what governments should do. Yeah. Uh, when governments like the United States fail to, and when the public fails to hold them uh, to account when they violate it, then it increases the chance that that green light um, will be seen as uh, given um, to countless regimes who otherwise wouldn't do it. Right. So uh, for people looking to kind of go into this whole anti-torture, um, like, set um what type of skills do they need in order to do this type of work that you're involved with you need guts and you need patience um uh, i uh, haven't worked on on torture issues now for almost five years but um the uh the the critical um skills that you need is uh really the organization is a critical one being able to organize a lot of different data points um, uh, available in the public record and available from um, interviews with sources and developing um, uh, assets within organizations that are engaged in torture, being able to put that mosaic together of what's really happening in facilities you can't access requires patience, guts, and uh, the ability to organize all those data points into one common picture. Right. So in terms of the um, organization of the data, you once said we gone into an experimental context on the most vulnerable people in the world and put them in a commodification posture where we're monetizing and trading their data. So how exactly are you able to prevent the misapplication and abuse of the data you receive? Well, what I'm talking, that's a different context from torture. Um, in that case, you're talking about um, the work I did uh, funded by George Clooney for the Satellite Sentinel Project, and that was an initiative um, I uh, was director of operations of from uh, December 2010 to the summer of 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. in, in that case, to give some context, we were using satellite imagery to detect and document threats to civilians in real time. Right. On the border was Sudan and uh, then the new country of South Sudan. And uh, what was um, uh, the, the really the ethical in, uh, issue there is that we were using a technology at scale in, an, in a way which um, was experimental. We had a hypothesis that we that satellite imagery surveillance of a area 
um, under attack um, or under threat of attack um, that it could potentially do what we called an ambient protective effect. And um, back then it was sort of science fiction in 2010, 2011. Now it's commonly used by humanitarian agencies um, to the degree to which it has been used for a very long time by intelligence services. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is part of a, a larger arc that's been going on of um, what is known as disaster experimentation um, on vulnerable populations. And we're seeing it now with COVID in yes. terms of ha how can tech tools uh, potentially change the trajectory of the virus. And um, the, so the, uh, the, the situation is that um, we really, we started that work with an absence of um, ethical standards for what rights do populations have when we're dealing not with individual data, but with population data. Right. So um, I thought the way you approached your project was phenomenal um, with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. So does your team work with governments and organizations once you've acquired the information and how do you carry it out with these other groups of people? So, um, well, I, I no longer run the Signal program. Right. Um, I resigned right. in 2018, now joined the faculty at Yale. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, uh, in the case of the work that they continue to do um, with humanitarian agencies, you can see. Oh, um. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear you. On one second here. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the Bluetooth shut off in my car. <laughs> um, so, um, the uh, so you can see an example on the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative website of uh, work that they're. Uh, either have just presented or will present to the Security Council, and that's from the Signal program. And in in that case, um, they uh, did analysis of for with Save the Children and other aid agencies of bombardment uh, in the Dar Azor region, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, of uh, I could be wrong of um, Syria. And uh, I haven't looked closely at the findings, but um they de-identified the coordinates from it um to be able to protect populations right and and, uh, and then they've provided the information to the united nations um in a way that actually state up about where that population is. okay and then does the united nations like peacekeeping group go in there and protect the civilians from there no, they have been left to die by the international community. Oh, shit. Um, I, I've, I've served as an advisor to UN peacekeeping in South Sudan, and I've worked closely with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations for a long time. The Department of Peacekeeping Operations, or the UN Blue Helmets, can only go in with it when there's a UN Security Council resolution, what's called Chapter 7 authorization. Okay. Um, because of Russian and Chinese veto on the Security Council, um, there's been very little traction on right. the Security Council taking decisive action to protect civilians in Syria and, and elsewhere right now, including um, multiple places in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Middle East. And so um, there's no peacekeeping um, in Syria, and there will likely be none. And Assad is on track to win that civil war um, that he's waged with impunity and gross crimes against humanity. Um, and he will likely, at present, it does not appear he'll be held to account, nor will there be some form of intervention to protect those civilians in Idlib. Right. And what would you say is the reason for 
maybe the United States not taking any decisive action on this issue? Um, well, we have to talk about which, you know, administration uh, we're speaking of in terms of the, the Trump administration. Uh, he removed U.S. forces from the Kurdish areas and basically um, uh, ended up leaving those civilians um, to uh, uh, Turkish forces mm -hmm. that were intervening into that, um, that zone. And uh, he's withdrawn U.S. forces that had been in a protective posture for some of the population. Um, so we, we've stepped back. In the case of Obama, he gave a red line about the use of chemical weapons, and then that red line was crossed by Assad, and he did not apply U.S. force. And so really the fact of the matter is there's no Security Council will because of the divided nature of the Security Council, and that the United States has shown a failure to um, uh, hold Assad account um, for clear violations of stated red lines. And, international law to interview U.S. forces in the region. Right. Okay. So for like the high schoolers watching right now, how could you say they could use satellite imagery to make an impact on this field and potentially with these types of initiatives you're working on? Have worked on. Well, I, I think the main thing is this, is that um, your generation right now should see geospatial uh, methods and uh, geospatial tools in general as um, a core component um, for, uh, for the um, sorry, uh, um, for methods and math as core to your future um, work as math or any other field of science. Right. Um, now in, in the age of information communication tech, Geospatial literacy is essential. So, uh, more and more, if you go into development or humanitarian response or human rights work, it, it is as much a, a you know, more and more map or serve you whether to work for Apple or you go to work for UNICEF. Okay. So, um, as a professor, what type of students are you specifically looking to impact? And how do you believe you do this differently than other professors at Yale and maybe even in your entire field? Oh, uh, I need something to pause for a sec. Um, yeah. You good to go? Um, I think your your audio is lagging a little bit. Might be because your video is on. Um, I don't know. How about now? Yeah, you're good. I think I get, you're good now. Okay. All right. Let's go for it. So, um, did you hear my question or should I repeat it? Uh, can you just repeat it for our viewers here? Yeah, sure. So, at a as a professor at Yale, what type of students are you specifically looking to impact? And how do you believe that you do this uniquely compared to other professors at Yale and in your field in general? So, to answer the second part first, um, I don't have a PhD. I am a, uh, a lecturer um, of practice, uh, you could say, meaning that my experience has been in the field. So right. I focus on 
um, my approach to teaching comes as a field practitioner, aiming to train um, uh, students to uh, be professionals. Uh, I'm not, not training PhDs. I'm uh, training future policy. Maker, future operators in the field. Right. Okay. Uh, and so for me, what I try to do in the classroom is really uh, create an environment policy where it includes in simulations and operational scenarios. And the types of students that I for are, are so, uh, the students I work most closely with. Uh, uh, that their coursework with me during the year builds towards. So I've had students intern at the World Food Program. Uh, this summer we'll have the International Community of the Red Cross. And I really try to make sure that anything I teach in the classroom, I'm creating opportunities for them to do it in real life. Right. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So as technology becomes more bright and shiny, humans, of course, are attracted to these alluring objects. Um, and ethics is clear in a necessity, which explains your reasoning in the past to have an ethics code. So how should we approach new technologies and with what mindset should we be prepared to continue growing? Well, the, um, that's a great question. And I, I think the mind of new technologies is that um, uh, technology is itself neutral. It's not ethical one way or the other. It gets to be an ethical matter once humans get in the picture. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and at that point, um, if a human has built the technology, they've built bias into it. Um, if they have um, applied the technology, it's applied in the context of um, bias and subjectivity. And uh, so the, the main thing is that a technical educational background will teach you how to work something. It's not going to teach you what it does in the real world. And we can only uh, have to look at Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Being able to build the thing doesn't mean you know how to manage it. Right. And in uh, and, and building something and deploying a tool um, may require math or chemistry or engineering to put the thing together, but to actually manage the sucker in the real world requires a knowledge of ethics, of law, of anthropology, of sociology. Um, and so the main thing is that you have to understand being an engineer is not being a technologist. <laughs> and being a technologist is really being about four different professions at once. So what I would say is um, constantly start with the population itself. If you are building a tool, make sure that's a solution they've identified. And it, as I've said all the time, as a colleague of mine once said that um, often we try to deploy it so we can make them take a walk, we could probably see what we were looking for. That makes, that does make sense. Um, so how would you say that, um, you know, like we have a lot of like issues regarding technology and ethics right now, especially because I think our Congress is not too familiar with a lot of the things that the American public is using right now. And so every time we try to bring people in, it just becomes, you know, a disaster. So, you know, within the next, within the next like decade or so, that should start to like ease up a little bit, maybe not as much as we want, but a little bit. So how would you say, what direction do you say we should go in? Well, I, I think you've identified it perfectly is that uh, we have a lack of technical literacy within our pol elected policymakers. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that there's two critical points here is one, there, there's a, um, Time is going to solve part of this, as my generation is your generation, um, that are more and more, uh, 
I guess you could say digital natives yeah. or digitally literate uh, move into those positions, the quality of the policy will increase because the digital literacy will increase as well as baby boomers uh, leave um, politics. Uh, the uh, I mean, uh, making digital literacy and public health literacy in the age of COVID a prerequisite for engagement in, in for running for elected office. We do that by realizing that these issues are not data ethics in election issue. Um, as Frederick Douglass said famously, power concedes nothing with a demand. Uh, you, your generation has to make a demand for data protection and for tech ethics or sound public health science um, to be an issue like taxes, like education. Um, if you make it a market demand uh, for those trying to get your vote, then that that's what we'll get. Change the quality. Yeah. 